expedition. True stories of man's quest for the unknown through the steaming jungles, across the burning desert, to the depths of treacherous seas, and to the highest mountains of the world. Expedition, actual films of the great expeditions of our time, recorded as they happen. Your host is the famous deep sea diver, author and explorer, Colonel John D. Craig. And here is Colonel Craig. Tonight we're going to take you inside the borders of Soviet Central Asia, a part of the world closed to Western explorers. We're going to follow a Russian expedition into some of the highest mountains of the world, the Pamirs. We'll get underway with this dramatic conquest of seven major peaks after a brief but important message. Almost any films we can get from inside Russia are of great interest. And tonight's film was doubly interesting to us because it's about mountaineering inside Russia. Our story takes us on an expedition to the Pamir Mountains. The Pamir is the central hub of the great Asian mountain system. The Himalaya extending toward the southeast, the Tian Shan toward the northeast between Russia and China, and the Hindu Kush toward the southwest. The Pamirs themselves include some of the highest mountains in the world. This Russian expedition set itself a fantastic goal to climb seven major peaks, all above 20,000 feet. Six of them were unscaled and even unnamed. Here is the dramatic first-hand account. All 21 of us come from the state of Georgia, which borders the Black Sea. It is July and we are on our way to Tajikistan to climb in the Pamir Mountains. None of us are professional climbers, but we are all enthusiastic members of the Georgian Alpine Club. Among us, we have two engineers, a doctor, two writers, a cameraman, three teachers, students, a geologist, a bookkeeper, and even some farmers. But all of us share this love for mountaineering. This is our fourth expedition to the Pamirs, but the first to this range, the Darvaza Range. There are seven good mountains waiting for us here, and only one of them, Garmo Peak, has been climbed. At sunset, we land in Tajikistan, where we will hire our transport. Our transport, camels. We are crossing the Vanch, the principal river of Tajikistan, which has its birth in the high glaciers. The camel is a traditional means of transportation here in Central Asia. We felt more like a caravan of old, carrying silk and spices, than like modern mountaineers. And I am ashamed to admit, some of us became quite seasick. Camels are very sure-footed where the ground is relatively level. But now the trails would become steeper, and at a village near here, we switched to horses and donkeys. Their owners came along to take care of their animals. And true to the tradition of the mountains, some of them carried rifles, long-barreled, old-fashioned guns dating back to the days when these mountains were infested by bandits. The country here is so beautiful. Empty of people, wild and rugged, and slashed by roaring glacial torrents which send their waters into the valley far below. Of all the pack animals I've ever used, the donkey is surely the most exasperating. Perhaps the stubborn donkey knew what was in store for it at this river. Normally, it is shallow enough to cross on foot, but the recent thaw had turned it into a raging torrent. What to do? A rope pulley is the answer. But first, some men had to make their way across to set up a support on the other side. In the international language of mountaineering, this is called a Tyrolean Traverse. First, 
We test the reliability of our engineering with a few packs. It works well. Next comes the men. They are heavier and pull the rope down almost to the water. It is a cold and wet crossing. The ropes are raised and this time only his bottom receives a little ice water. A little donkey pioneered the crossing for the rest of the pack animals. But the others were too heavy to be flown across. They were secured to ropes to swim as best they could. The current was terrible and I'm certain that without our help, the poor creatures would have been drowned. In time, we brought everything safely across, and there, waiting for us in the distance, lay the Darvasa Range. The main camp was established at 3,300 meters, about 10,000 feet. Our animals and the drivers would wait here for our return. Only the assault party and several porters would continue to establish base camp at 14,000 feet. A women doctor also would remain here. But before we were allowed to climb, each of us received a complete checkup. Radio communications were set up so that regular reports of our progress could be sent out. Early the next morning, we started out, each of us carrying a heavy pack for the difficult assault on the seven peaks of the Darvasa range. Each summer I climb, and each summer I feel very small in the face of such immensity. Yet there is the urge to pit oneself against danger, and perhaps to stand on its summits. For some hours we climbed, with a boiling stream beside us. When the sun had traveled high into the deep blue Pamir sky, we reached a magnificent waterfall. We marveled at the flying bridges and deep black gorges carved into the rock by the relentless power of the water as it tumbled and roared down from the glaciers which gave it birth. We were following the same route taken some years before by another expedition which had ended in a terrible disaster. 2,000 feet above us stood a lonely memorial to the five men who died on that climb. We wanted to stop and pay our respects before we continued. As we moved slowly up toward the memorial, we felt again the sadness in our hearts. Those mountain years had been from our club and many of us had known them well. At 12,000 feet, the wind blew low clouds across our path like a cold gray veil. Then we were there, and each of us placed a small bunch of flowers from the valley at the granite slab into which their names had been scratched by their companions. Romanovich, Mikhailov, Tishchenko, Repkin, Shanin, and the year of their death, 1953. We made steady progress, but it was not all straight up. Many times we climbed hundreds of meters, only to descend again even further. Here we were again at 10,000 feet, working our way through an immense glacier of great beauty. The color of the ice ranged from white to pale green and blue. The glacier was not a continuous river of ice, but slashed and cut by deep crevasses. It was never recorded or named previously, and so we named it in honor of our Georgian Geographical Society. We crossed this high bridge of fragile ice 
and did not dare breed till we were safely on the other side. After climbing all day, we made camp at 11,500 feet, only 1,500 feet higher than we had been this morning. Ahead lay the Darvasa range, with Garmo, the highest peak. A good hot meal helps to keep body and spirit together, for we had a hard day's work ahead. The very dangerous Garmo icefall stood between us and the base campsite, 3,600 feet above us. Our first task was to establish a safe route through the icefall. Then, for a week, relay teams would bring up more supplies and equipment from our depot until we were fully ready for the actual assault on the Seven Peaks. To save time, we carried loads much heavier than usual, 70 or 80 pounds per man instead of 40. It made the going harder, but many days would pass before any more supplies could reach us. And if there should be bad weather, we might be cut off even longer. A brief rest just below the ice fall. Here in the snow, the sun can cause a serious burn very quickly. Compass readings help, but in the end, it's a man's hands and feet that must find the safest route. The Garmo Icefall has many deep crevasses, often hidden by a deceptive blanket of snow or a thin crust of ice. Safety ropes must be used here, for one false step could send a man hundreds of feet down to his death. The man in sharpest spears gave the route an eerie beauty, but also great danger. I have seen such icicles crash down on a climber without warning. Only the sound of the peak and our own hard breathing breaks the silence of this fairyland picture. Does anyone ever think of the cameraman on such an expedition? None of us envied him his task. He had to climb more than any of us to get such spectacular pictures. Here was a deep and dangerous crevasse with uncertain edges of soft snow. To get across, jump. Almost. 14,000 feet. And now soon, the real battle for the top. Before I saw this film, I never thought of Russians as mountaineers, any more than I would have thought of camels as an essential part of a mountaineering expedition. One lives and learns. And we can all learn something from this important message. It took seven days to move all necessary supplies to base camp. But now on August 5, we greeted the sunrise with great excitement, for this was to be the day. Alas, we were disappointed. Dense snow clouds blanketed our objective. We had to wait another 24 hours for the weather to improve. But when it did, the sight was magnificent. The Darvaza Range, six of its seven peaks still unclimbed. We decided first of all to climb the highest, Garmo Peak, 21,686 feet. But then we gave ourselves an even greater challenge, to climb the other six unscaled peaks before returning to base camp. It was a very difficult goal, but we were confident. The assault party was ready to leave camp. There were 13 of us. The men carried heavy packs, including lightweight tents, 
sleeping bags, a 12-day supply of food and fuel, hammers, picks, hooks, spades, and first aid kits. We did not expect the assault to take 12 days, but there was always the possibility of serious delays through bad weather or accidents. In 10 hours of stiff climbing, we covered 2,300 feet, an average of only 230 feet per hour. This brought us to over 16,000 feet, where the air is thin, and every step an effort. We were not yet quite accustomed to the lack of oxygen, but we soon would be. The next day, the weather was bad again. Low clouds, icy winds, and driving snow made the going sheer torture. The map shows Camp 3 on the upper right, just below the summit of Garmo. At 20,000 feet, a wall of ice presented a serious hazard. Progress was slowed down considerably. Fresh snow covered the ice in thin deceptive layers, so great care had to be taken with every step. 21,400 feet. The summit is now only 280 feet away. Anticipated the worst, but were rewarded with a gentle slope. The summit of Garmo is reached without mishap, the only one of the seven peaks ever scaled before. It is a good omen, and we feel exhilarated. Now comes the descent from Garmo and the assault on the first of the six virgin mountains of the Darvaza Range. Up to now, it is known only as a nameless peak, 20,717 feet high. We will have the privilege of naming it. On August 8, 10 members of the first assault team reached the summit. It is difficult to put into words one's feelings at such a moment, to be on the top of an unclimbed mountain where no one else has ever been before, looking at the world around you. We thought of many names for our mountain, and they decided to call it Rodeki Peak, in memory of a famous poet of Tajikistan. It was fitting that we should honor the homeland of such mountains. Our victory left five more unclimbed peaks to be scaled. Below us, fog was closing in once again and the temperature dropped sharply, but we were confident. The next two peaks were over 20,000 feet, but we felt neither would be difficult. After descending from Rudeki, camp was established. Then in 12 solid hours of climbing, the same team scaled both summits in a single day. The first was named Aini, after another Tajik poet. The second we named Festival Peak. A midway camp was set up at 18,000 feet to rest for the next assault. Through our glasses, we have studied the objective, nameless peak number four, 20,355 feet high, and suspected it was going to be a strong and difficult opponent. Just how difficult we were to discover in a few short hours. The day of the assault was beautiful and clear, even though there were many clouds in the deep blue sky. A perfect day for a hard climb. A school teacher is now in the lead. Three weeks ago, he was teaching children arithmetic. Now he has nothing on his mind but the mountain, and it is by far the most difficult of all. Scale such a gigantic rock wall, almost straight up for more than 3,000 feet, it is hard work at any altitude. But here at almost 20,000 feet, where the air is so thin and breathing so difficult, it is the ultimate test of a man's physical strength and his will to win. Every step upward is sheer agony. The breath comes in short, painful gasps. Every muscle in the body is strained to the utmost, and yet you drag yourself upward, higher and higher, 
because to give up is unthinkable. All the others so far, Garmo, Rudecki, Aini, Festival, they were child's play compared to this giant who did not want to be conquered by puny men and who told us so in no uncertain terms. The crash set off a gigantic avalanche. We watched transfixed as its terrible roar set off more immense slides above us, and even closer. We were unbelievably lucky. We could have been swept like flies off the mountain. The assault is resumed up a steep and narrow couloir a corridor of snow held between rock walls. With every step, the air becomes thinner. The long rock climb has drained our strength. Eyes burn, lips are cracked. There is a singing in the ears. It is hard to focus when thinking. We move like automatons. Two kicks and a dragging step. Two more kicks and one more step. Up and up, it seems forever. How do we look to those below? Like ants, lost in a scene of breathtaking beauty. But we on top have no thought for beauty now. The struggle is too great. The wet, sticky snow clings to our sinking, dragging feet like quicksand. But it cannot hold us back from the summit in victory. It was no longer nameless peak number four. We named it Mount Tbilisi in honor of our hometown. Exhaustion is forgotten in its moment of victory, in the face of such magnificence. Our second team was anxious for a chance and scaled the last two unclimbed peaks two days later. Seven mountains in seven days. The assault had taken us clear from the eastern end to the westernmost peak of the Darvaza range. The descent led through another unrecorded icefall with immense seracs, giant towers of ice pushed up by the moving glacier. But we were soon out of that, and from here on we moved with ease and joy like exuberant children. At base camp, a warm welcome awaited us from the leader of the expedition and our fine support team. They told us that already the radio was broadcasting the news of our victory. They were even calling us heroes back home. We did not feel we had done anything heroic, but it was nice to be appreciated. We were happy men. We had had a good climb and good fortune. So tonight we've seen Russian mountaineers and the little-known Pamirs. You know, one thing strikes me after seeing such a film. These days all the talk is about exploring outer space, going to the moon or Mars or Venus to see what's up there. And yet there is still so much of our own planet that we know nothing about or at best very little. That's true about Russia also. Sometimes it seems to me that we do so much looking at the stars that we forget to look at the earth beneath our feet or into the sea around us. And by doing that, we miss a lot that is both fascinating and useful. Filling that need is what makes this program so exciting to all of us connected with it. Just take our next expedition, for example. It explores a subject about which we still know very little, proving that there's a lot left to learn about our shrinking globe. I hope you won't miss this very interesting program. Until then, this is John Craig saying thank you and good night.